Okay, welcome back everybody to block three. Uh, this block is going to be all about the executive branch, uh, primarily about the President of the United States. We're going to get into some of the functions and what that looks like. So buckle up your seatbelt and let's go on a ride to the White House. Um, so the first thing we're going to see um, that we're going to talk about is just like from our last unit, we talked about the Constitution. Uh, everything that the president can do essentially is stated in the Constitution under Article 2. Um, this sets up the executive branch. Um, these are some of the things that the president must um, or somebody has to be in order to be the president. Uh, so number one is if you are going to be president, you have to select a vice president to help you govern. Um, you also have to be 35 years old, so don't forget we want to write that down in your notes. Um, you definitely need to be born in the United States or have parents um, that are U.S. citizens um, if you were born somewhere else. For example, I know Ted Cruz, both his parents are American, but he was born in Canada, um, so he would still be eligible. Um, you also, if you are uh, going to be president, you can only do it for two terms that are four-year terms. Um, so that's kind of the requirements if you're going to be president. Um, in terms of the checks the president has to balance out um, the other two branches, uh, the president's able to appoint members of the executive branch. We'll talk about this more in a little bit. Um, and the president also has the power to appoint Supreme Court judges although those judges do have to uh, get confirmed by the senate um and he also uh appoints other federal judges um and we'll also talk about that in our next block um and the power for um the president over congress is that he can veto bills that are sent to um their office so that's just some of the um basic kind of stuff about the president moving on to our next slide um i think you'll you have a question there somewhere what are some of the other titles that the president goes by? Well, holy cow, the president's got a lot of titles. Uh, let's just flip through some of them. Uh, president, um, one of the most common ones I hear about nowadays is POTUS. That's a fun one. It's essentially like an acronym. Um, president of the United States, POTUS. Um, so if you ever hear that, that's one of his shortened titles. Um, president is also known as the Commander-in-Chief, um, heading the United States military. He's also known as the chief of state, uh, chief administrator, the chief diplomat directing foreign policy. Um, he's also known as the chief legislator. Uh, he's able to kind of push Congress in the direction uh, that he's wanting to see it go or she's wanting to see it go. Um, so those are some of those titles. You can jot down any one, any one of those that you want to. Um, now let's get into the president's cabinet. So the president, I always remember when I was in school hearing the president's cabinet, I always thought it was like, uh, like an actual drawer, like cabinets in a um, kitchen or in a, in a drawer that you would have. So I was, when I heard the president's cabinet, I thought it was like somewhere in his kitchen where he kept his dishes. Oh, brother! Little did I know that the president's cabinet, um, which I later went on to learn, um, was actually not furniture at all. It was actually the people the president picks to help enforce the laws. So don't forget, the whole point of the presidency under Article 2 um, in the Constitution is that he or she in the future um, is known as um, the person that's going to enforce the laws of the land. Um, and that's a big job. So to do this job, the president essentially has a lot of people that they get to pick to help him do this. And that's exactly what the definition is. So the president's cabinet both give him, him or her advice, um, and they also help them run the government and the departments. Um, every single person the president picks um, in their cabinet has the official uh, title of secretary. So just like when you think of the word secretary, like maybe if you go into an office um, and there's a secretary sitting there, the secretary most likely is helping whoever the person in charge of whatever it is, whether it's a business or a school um, or anything like that. The secretary is the one that helps them do kind of some of the um, day-to-day -to -day -day things that come up um, for that job. So um, almost all of them are known as secretary of and then whatever kind of department it is. Um, the only ones that don't have that title are the chief of staff and the attorney general. Um, so if we look at some of these secretarial positions, if that's a word, um, one of the first ones on here is just the Department of Agriculture, which is essentially like farming. So essentially the president picks uh, 
a person who's known as the Secretary of um, Agriculture, and they're in charge of helping the president enforce any laws or legislation that has to do with farming. Yeah, so let's look at some of these other ones. So if you look at like um, the Department of Education, this would be like the Secretary of Education. So anything related to enforcing laws related to education, this secretary would be officially in charge of that. Um, Department of Labor, um, Department of State, this would be like the Secretary of State, things like that. Um, so if we look on our next slide, I wanted to show you two different um, cabinets. This was uh, from 2008. Here we have George uh, W. Bush at the time. And these are all the people that George W. Uh, Bush picked to help him run the government when he was in office. Um, if we zoom forward to the next slide, uh, this is President Obama and the um, cabinets that he picked. So anytime you're becoming a new president, um, from when you get elected to um, when you uh, essentially officially take office in January, one of the first things you're doing is going through and you're picking all these people that are going to help you do this job. So the, power, the president has a lot of power um, in getting to decide who these people are that they pick. And almost always, not all the time, but almost always, um, whoever the new president is will end up essentially getting rid of um, a lot of the uh, old president's cabinet and putting in um, all new president presidential cabinet picks. So on to the Electoral College. So the Electoral College um, is kind of confusing, but I think I can explain it in a way that makes sense. Um, so it's the process used to elect the president. So if you're going to become president, you got to go through Electoral College. Um, it sounds like a place you might go um, for uh, education after high school, college, but it's actually not a, really a college at all. It's more just like a group of people. So to explain this, I'm going to bounce to this website. Uh, you can click the link here, um, or you can just kind of follow along in this slideshow. Um, but essentially, if you're planning on running for president, uh, one of the very first things you would have to do is you would have to look at this map. This is a map that shows you the state electoral votes. So the best way I could explain this is that each state has a number um, based on the total members of Congress that it has. So let's just look at Colorado. Colorado has seven House of Representative mem members, which we remember from block number two, hopefully. Um, and then we also know that Colorado has two senators. Um, if you combine those, uh, simple math, you, 7 plus 2 equals 9 total Congress people. So if you do that for each state, you can kind of see that your number is going to be bigger based on your House of Representatives. So let's jump to, uh, let's take a look at a state like California. Holy schmauzers, 55 total um, Congress people, 53 in the House and 2 for the Senate, which means that California has the most um, electoral or I'm sorry, the most um, congressional people that would make up that representation. Now, what does this have to do with picking the president? Well, here's what it means, and here's how it works. If you're going to be president, one of the first things you would need to do is you would have to sit down and go through, and you would have to select 11 people from Washington, 7 people from Oregon, 55 people from California, 5 people. Well, actually, I'm going to back it up real quick. If you're planning on running for president in the Electoral College, you would need to start by looking and seeing all these numbers. And then essentially you would want to find your most loyal, like best supporters that would never um, go against you in each state. So if you look here in our last election, you can see that that's exactly what Donald Trump did. So essentially Donald Trump went through every single state and had his 538 people all picked out ready to go w way before the election ever happened. And just like he had his 538 people selected, Hillary Clinton also had her 538 people selected. So before election night, each candidate has all their electors picked out. Now on the actual day of, when it's time to do the actual election, on election night, technically, the map is going to look like this. It will be it would be blank. And the election results usually start somewhere on the East Coast first. So let's just say we flash back um, to the election night. Let's just say, since Maine is the first um, one that we can see on the East Coast, let's just say that they happen to vote there first. So on election night, the people of Maine 
would go out and vote. Now whoever would get the most votes for Maine, as you can see it has four total Congress people there, whoever would get the most would actually get those four elector people. So if it went to Trump, then that means that Trump's four elector people that are his representatives that he picked out, they would be going to uh, vote for him. Uh, now if Clinton had one Maine, she would have um, had her four people that would have gone and you can see as soon as you start as soon as election results start coming in you can see that each candidate starts getting their electors filled out with the number that matches that state and you can kind of start to see that whoever is moving along um, eventually we'll get to the number and the magic number this is in your notes but we'll say it again is 270 so if we flash back to the election night and we see the actual results so if we go back to election night and see what actually happened you can see well we know the outcome we know that Donald Trump essentially got more than 270 electorals to win and Clinton got 232 but you can see that anywhere there's blue those had Clinton won her electorals from these blue states would have essentially gone out and voted for her had Trump so well, we know Trump did win so anywhere you go in these places these people so let's just take Kansas as our next door neighbor so why don't we just take Kansas on election night the six people who were Trump's picks that were his people that he selected um, they essentially get super excited because they would know that they would actually get to go out and vote and the vote so the election happens in early November and in December 19th is when the president actually gets um, elected because that's when the electorals go to vote. So Trump's six people would have gone out on December 20... It's either 21st or 31st. Oh, here it is. It's this. Um, Trump's people would have gone out, his six people, and they would have voted for him. Um, and they would have been six people pushing Trump to getting past that 270 mark, which as we know is what happened. So that's essentially how the Electoral College works. So every year is the next election that's coming up. If you're planning on running for president, you better get ready to start um, helping out with the selection process of picking who are your 538 people going to be because on the election night, if the people in that state vote for you, then your electoral people are going to be the one that go out and vote. And once you get 270, that's how you become president. Okay, so that's the electoral college in a nutshell. So other responsibilities of the president is that he is our... Um, commander-in-chief meaning he's in charge of the United States military so essentially the four main branches of the United States uh, military including the Navy the Marines the Army and the Air Force um, and that's kind of what we see here is the essentially the leaders from those branches of the military they essentially all would report to the president and the president essentially is able to give orders on what military action to take there are some limits in terms of declaring war um, that are not the power of the president um, but the president has a lot of leeway in uh, how they see fit in using the United States military. Um, president is also the chief diplomat as well. Uh, if there's ever a major issue, the president is our number one representative to go over and represent us uh, if, you, if we're dealing with a, a foreign country. Directing the budget. This is the actual uh, budget. It's what it looks like um, from 2013 for the United States. So the president is in charge of putting pressure on Congress to pass a budget. So the president and his team sit down, they come up with what they want to spend money on, and they turn it over to Congress. And they say, we recommend, or we really would like you to spend this much money on these programs. Now Congress doesn't have to listen to the recommendation, but it's still stated that the president is in charge of making that um, recommendation and putting pressure on Congress to put that budget forward. All right, executive orders. So. More people in the United States work for the federal government than any other company. The federal government under the executive branch is humongous. It's huge. It employs millions and millions of people. When you think about like the United States military alone, um, there are millions of people that work for the United States military. Um, any of those cabinet positions we talked about earlier are filled with people. And what an executive order is, is the president has the power to give out orders on how this huge group of people carry out the executive orders in terms of 
carrying out the, the law of the land that's created by Congress. So the official definition of uh, executive order would be the essentially the orders given by the president stating how the executive will enforce the laws. How is really the key there. Um, I know you're jotting down in force, but really how the president decides to do this. So if you look at immigration, um, essentially it's a law that says that you have to follow a legal process to come to the United States legally. However, there are people that don't follow the legal prog process um, that come to the United States and don't do it um, legally. Um, what the president has done with one of his executive orders, at least President Obama, um, President Obama put out an executive order that essentially became known as DACA. It was known as um, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. Uh, really, all you need to know for that is that Pre President Obama basically came out and said, hey, I know that there's like 11 million undo undocumented people in the United States. Um, I know I'm, as Commander-in-Chief and the President, I'm in charge of enforcing the law and making sure that I work to essentially make sure that these people are following a legal process. However, President Obama said the way he's going to choose how to enforce the law was that he essentially said, if you're a young person and you came here and can prove you've been in the United States for five years um, and you for the most part have stayed out of trouble and you apply for DACA, I will choose to not enforce deportation for you. You basically are, I'm guaranteeing you that I will not deport you. So that's one example of an executive order where Obama essentially was saying, I am going to choose to not enforce this part of the law. Um, yeah, and that's what, um, just one particular example. So again, executive orders, anytime the president comes out and says, I am going to choose all my cabinet and all my employees that work for me to enforce the law in this way. So it's kind of the how is the key um, of the executive order. Okay, and you can take a look at the rest of this infographic if you want to. All right, some miscellaneous things the president also does. The president has the um, ability to pardon individuals. Essentially, the president can let people out of jail for free. He basically could just say, uh, you were convicted of murder, you get to go. Um, you were convicted of smuggling drugs, you can go. Um, it... It's something that um, presidents do do. Almost every president that I know of has pardons people. Um, president Obama has pardoned, um, I want to say, more people um, than any other president. I, I'd have to double check that, though. I'll let you know. Um, one of the things that I know President Obama focused on um, towards the end of his term was he was he really didn't like the idea of such harsh sentences for nonviolent um, drug offenses. So there were people that essentially were busted for um, like doing something illegal with like um, like a nonviolent drug offense, like smuggling marijuana over the border or something like that, and they got life in prison. And he spent a lot of time essentially saying, you know, you've been in prison for 20 years, you can go free. Um, so this is kind of a, a perk or whatever you want to call it that the president has. It's almost really like a, another check the president has against the judicial branch that if the judicial branch does find somebody guilty, that they're able to come in and say, yeah, we know you found them guilty, but they're free. Um, now, if the president starts letting murderers go and people who were convicted, it's probably not going to go over so well for them. Um, so they usually typically keep the pardon power to a minimum, but it is definitely something that happens. Um, another important thing we're going to get into is the line of succession for president. This is essentially who the president, um, who would take over for the president if the president ever... Um, was uh, assassinated or died of natural causes while in office. This is essentially the order. It goes president, then vice president, then the speaker of the house, which we learned in from the last unit, then this weird term called the president pro tempore, um, which is the longest serving senator, as far as I understand. Not sure how they came up with that one. Maybe they wanted somebody who had a lot of experience um, because they had served for a long time. And then the secretaries. I forget which secretary starts, but essentially it's like Secretary of State, Secretary of um, Defense, just kind of like down the line. Um, I think there was a show that just came out with, uh, didn't just come out, but it's out right now, a show with uh, Kiefer Sutherland, um, where like almost everybody in the government gets killed and he was like the Secretary of like Labor or something. 
and he becomes president. Um, and, and that show does a pretty good job of showing what that would look like. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. This is a video clip that's on Google Classroom, um, which gets into some of the things the president can and can't do. Um, you can check that one out. Um, how did Obama do as president? This is another interesting um, link that I have in Google Classroom where you would be able to go in and um, check out um, how you think President Obama did with certain things and you get to see how he really did. So kind of a cool thing you could also check out. All right, and that's it. That was the end of block um, three. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I know I did. Um, anyways, we'll see you for the next block, block four. Toodles.